Imagine a future where you can predict when any disease might occur. Treat any disorder in real time and even prevent diseases from ever happening. This is the future of medicine, one where we will be able to create a precise roadmap for a disease-free life. As an independent, nonprofit research institute focused on genomics research, JAX has nearly a century of experience, the cutting-edge tools, the award-winning researchers, and the foresighted vision to make this exciting future possible. We are an extended family of scientists, employees, friends, and donors who are determined to unravel the mystery of human disease to find cures. In fact, at JAX, cures are in our DNA. We were the first to describe stem cells, we developed the techniques now widely used for human fertility treatments. We performed the first bone marrow transplants. We unlocked the capability for today's organ transplants. And 26 Nobel Prizes were awarded for discoveries based on our models. These and many other Jack's discoveries continue to save countless lives around the world. And we're driven to do more. We are ready to craft predictive tests, guide lifestyle changes, uncover new prevention methods, and identify new therapies. We are ready to change the face of human health for you. Join us today. Good afternoon. My name is Caitlin Iarillo, and I'm the Associate Director of Stewardship for the Jackson Laboratory. Welcome to the fourth virtual event in our Juxtaposition Speaker Series. For those of you who are not familiar with the Jackson Laboratory, we are a nonprofit biomedical research institute with a mission to improve human health through genetics and genomics research. Today, you will hear from two experts about new strategies for tackling breast cancer and the future of treatment and therapies. Before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to note that you may submit questions at any time throughout the event by using the Q&A function on the right of your screen. We thank you in advance for your questions and we will work to get through as many of them as we can during the Q&A section at the end of the program. I'd now like to in introduce Dr. Mark Adams, who will serve as our moderator during today's conversation. Mark serves as Deputy Director and Professor and Director of Clinical Diagnostic Research at the Jackson Laboratory for Genomic Medicine in Farmington. His group develops and applies approaches to microbial profiling in human studies and develops mouse models for demonstrating the roles of microbes in health and disease states. Dr. Francesca Menji is also here with us today. Francesca is an associate research scientist at the Jackson Laboratory and studies critical genomic changes implicated in ovarian and breast cancers. Francesca joined the laboratory from the Genome Institute of Singapore, where she was a postdoctoral fellow in the laboratory of Dr. Edison Liu, who is now JAX's president and CEO. You can read more about both of our speakers on the event page. Thank you both for joining us this afternoon. Mark, I'll turn it over to you. All right, thank you, Caitlin, and thanks to those of you who have dialed in for the program this afternoon. Um, looking forward to having a chance to chat with you about some of the work that's going on at the Jackson Lab and to hear from Francesca about some of her very interesting work in breast cancer. Um, so um, we can just dive right into that, I think, and uh, start by asking you, Francesca, a little bit about sort of how you got here. What's been your path to Jax? Absolutely. Well, good afternoon, Mark and Aileen, and good afternoon to the attendees. It's, uh, it's really my pleasure to be here today to discuss our research. So how I got here, it's been um, a very um, interesting and, and long road. Um, it started with, um, I would say, a very um, um, excellent uh, genetic class in high school where my professor discussed um, how DNA, such a critical molecule, um, with all the information that makes our cell work. And, and that really um, was so fascinating to me that I decided I wanted to learn more and more. Um, so that, me, that brought me to follow um, a biotechnology uh, path during my college um, degree, which I um, eventually got in Milan, Italy. That's where I'm from. If people are worried, are wondering what my accent is, it's Italian. <laughs> so um, after that, um, 
I decided that I needed to understand a little bit more how to handle all the massive amount of data that in those years we were starting to accumulate. And so I decided I needed to learn a little bit more about computational biology and not just about, about genetics. So I um, studied for a master's in bioinformatics. Um, that then led me to um, apply for a PhD um, position to study, um, to study brain cancers. And then eventually that led me to um, join Professor Ed uh, Lu's lab in Singapore, the Gen Genomic Institute of Singapore, to start um, um, research uh, by utilizing the very uh, novel technologies that at that time were being developed and that would allow us to study um, cancer genomes in even more detail. Um, and then from there, I came eventually here to um, the Jackson Laboratory following, uh, following um, Ed Lu's leadership once again. Um, so it's been um, a little winding road and, and it's been very exciting throughout. That's great. So yeah, I, I, folks I'm sure may know uh, Ed Liu as the president of JAX, but may not know that he has a very active research lab. Um, so uh, may, maybe you could say just a little bit about the, the lab and the overall scope of what's, what's going on there. Yes, absolutely. Our laboratory here at the Jackson Lab has been focused for many years now um, on studying uh, breast and ovarian cancer genomics. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more in detail um, about the, what it actually means to study um, cancer genomics. But our main goal is really to appreciate the complexity of um, cancer cell, to understand what are the very first steps that lead to the transformation of a normal cell into a cancer cell and um, to be able to distinguish different forms of cancer, even though they might or originate in the same organ, they can be very different. So we're trying to really distinguish different subtypes. And um, with that in mind, we also want to optimize treatments for patients. Um, so our laboratory um, is um, a very good balance between um, experimental research that involves the use of um, cancer models, such as the cell lines that we can grow and study in the laboratory, as well as mouse models of breast cancer and um, um, more um, humanized models of breast cancer, which are uh, we call them patient-derived xenografts, and they're um, human cancer tissues that are engrafted into recipient mice, and we can study them as well. So we use all these tools and models to test our hypotheses and generate data. But on the other hand, we also do a lot of computational work. And as I mentioned before, um, our ability right now to um, interrogate the cancer genome is um, incredible. We can really really um, have a, a very complete overview of all um, the changes that occur within a cancer cell. And, and that really generates um, a huge amount of data that we um, need to be able to understand and analyze with specific um, computational tools. So that also requires um, um, you know, a, a whole different level of expertise. So in our lab, we have these two sides that integrate really well. Um, and so uh, we spend time uh, doing experimental work and then time doing computational work, trying to analyze all these data. That's, that's great. I think that integration of sort of wet lab and dry lab work, as, as we call it, is really you know, particular, it's it's become the norm for research in a lot of areas, but it's really particularly true in cancer, which is, of course, such a complex disease, and there's so many aspects that are involved with that. How do you kind of navigate that process of deciding what to work on and and how to, how you've gotten to the project that you're that you're going to tell us about? Yes, um, it's absolutely true, and um, um, you know sometimes the choice of the path to follow is somewhat serendipitous because we're looking at the data and, and then some patterns occurs and we start wondering why do we see this pattern recurring all the time? And then we delve into that, uh, we make hypotheses and we try to understand it better. But you know, to be a little bit more specific, why don't I uh, pull up some slides and give you um, a bit more of a detailed introduction to our current research um, at the Jackson Lab. Um, so I'm going to put this in presentation mode. All right, I'm going to start um, by just telling you a very simple statement that, however, um, contains um, 
a, a major truth that is on what guides our research every day. And that statement is that cancer is a disease of the DNA. And you might wonder, what does it actually mean? So um, before we try to answer this question, let me um, introduce you to a very um, useful metaphor that parallels uh, the um, cancer DNA or a normal cell DNA as well, our genetic code to a language uh, which comprises a very simple alphabet made up of only four letters, A, T, C, G. Um, in genetics, we call these nucleotides and they symbolize by the first letter of, uh, of their biochemical structure. Um, a, T, C, G, that is four simple letter alphabet makes up the entire DNA of our cells. And it's organized in three letter words. Um, in, again, in genetics, we call these codons. Um, and co a combination of three letter words make up sentences that in our metaphor are genes. Um, these sentences can be long or short, can be uh, more or less complex. Um, and, you know, um, there's an estimation of roughly 30,000 genes in our genome. We continue to understand more, and this number keeps increasing as we um, understand that certain sentences are not as um, um, regular as we expect them to be. But you know, for um, the sake of this metaphor, let's consider roughly 30,000 of these sentences. And they're organized in chapters, which are discrete um, physical unit of information. Um, and in this metaphor, they are chapters that are actually chromosomes. We have 46 of them. In, um, every one of our cells, and um, the totality of all the DNA contained in this 46 chromosome represents our genome. So when we talk about cancer genome or cancer genomics, we actually refer to the study of the entire um, alphabet that is contained in our cells, these uh, three billions of letters or nucleotide that are organized in words, sentences, and chapters. So this is what happens in every single cell in our body. But why are we so interested in studying DNA with respect to cancer? And that's because uh, a cancer cell is really just a normal cell where um, changes in the um, in these sentences have occurred, and and so that cell starts behaving differently. And so. Um, if we keep working on this metaphor, let me just introduce you to mutations. Mutations are changes that occur in our um, DNA. Um, and in this case, I'm, I'm just using a very simple three-letter word sentence as the wild type. And in genetics, wild type refer to the normal state, the kind of background baseline state. So in this case, I um, just made up a, a simple sentence that is the fat cat ate the rat. So simple, easy, the meaning is clear. So there's different type of mutations that can occur. Um, some of the most common ones are represented here. One such type of mutation is called substitution. It's basically one single letter uh, change. In this case, the F has been replaced by an H. So you can still read the sentence, and the meaning is a little bit um, off. There's something that doesn't quite sound right, but there's still um, overall the same structure is maintained. Um, then other forms of mutations are deletions and duplication. And as they come into flavors, I'm going to give you two examples of each. A deletion could, uh, for example, be um, the removal of a complete three-letter word from the sentence. So this is, in this case, uh, the sentence now read the cat ate the rat. Uh, we still maintain the meaning, but we have lost some information, right? A little attribute of the subject of the sentence has been lost. Um, in another scenario, we only remove one letter in the sentence. And now, because the um, genetic code is read in three letter words, the entire reading frame has shifted upwards. Uh, and now the entire sentence is completely legible. And we um, are not able to understand the meaning of it. So if you imagine that this sentence is actually a gene, you can easily understand how now one single letter deletion has completely disrupted the activity of that gene. And similarly, duplications act in a similar way. We can have a duplication, which is um, an extra copy of an entire word. Um, in this case, um, the word fat has been duplicated. And the effect is that we are emphasizing um, an attribute of that sentence. You can imagine if this were to be a gene that we'd emphasize its activity, we uh, increase its dosage. Or we could have a duplication of one single letter. And again, as the example I showed you before with the deletion, we now have a shift in the reading frame um, downwards of one letter. And that makes the entire sentence illegible. So 
the reason why I'm giving you this uh, simple um, example is because our lab has been particularly interested in the study of duplications in both their flavors. And that's because we found that these events are incredibly common in the genome of a specific subset of breast cancer patients. So before I give you a little, a little bit more details um, about this, let me just remind you that a breast cancer comes in different form. Um, and I think that most of the audience um, is, is very well aware that we are able to um, subdivide uh, breast cancer uh, based on the presence of specific molecules on the surface of the cancer cells. Um, for example, um, there is a, a very common form of breast cancer that is um, um, estrogen receptor positive and or progesterone receptor positive. Um, and also there's another subtype of breast cancer that is called HER2 receptor amplified. Um, this type of cancer have been the subject of research over the past decade that has been incredibly successful in developing novel treatments for um, uh, tackling this type of cancer that are specifically directed at cells that express these um, um, molecules. And for example, that led to the development of hormonal therapy for the treatment of estrogen and progesterone positive tumors and the development of monoclonal antibodies that specifically target HER2 amplified tumors. But what our lab has been particularly interested in, it's a different form of breast cancer that is called triple negative. And you can imagine why that name comes from is because these tumors are negative for all three of the receptors that have been discussed in the previous slide. Um, and so it, it is um, particularly interesting that we're in fact naming this subtype of cancer by what it lacks and not really by what it is. And that really suggests that we don't know much about this type of tumor. And unfortunately, that also translates in the uh, lack of specific targeted uh, therapies for this type of cancer. And so um, up, as of today, the standard of care treatment for triple negative breast cancer patient is generic chemotherapy. So we really wanted to understand better how these triple negative breast cancer originate, what drives their growth, and um, what can we do to improve the um, clinical uh, management of triple negative breast cancer patients. And because, as I told you before, uh, cancer is a disease of the DNA, we looked at the DNA of triple negative breast cancers. And when we did that, uh, somewhat surprisingly, we observed that in roughly 50% of cases, we saw hundreds of duplications that were scattered throughout the genome. And this is just a little visual help to give you an idea of how extensive this was. And it was completely um, um, unexpected in some ways. We had never seen that before in other type of cancers. But all these duplications were um, really affecting the overall um, biology of those cells. And you can imagine, um, if you remember what I told you before, how duplications can really affect um, the activity of the genes and having hundreds of them scattered throughout the genome can really have a major impact on hundreds of genes at once. And in fact, let, let me give you another visual um, example of what this in fact means. So imagine this is a screenshot of a normal cell DNA. Um, so I talked to you about genes. We have so many thousands of them um, in our cells, but we can also subgroup them based on their generic functions. And when we study cancer, we're particularly interested in two major groups of genes. The first group, uh, we call them tumor suppressor. So the word gives away their uh, function. These are genes that regulate um, cell behavior. Uh, we are symbolizing them here with blue words such as check and stop, control. Um, these genes role is really to make sure that cells divide when they have to and that they are un, you know, under proper control and they're policed properly. Um, there's another category of genes that we are particularly interested in, and we call them oncogenes. Um, I'm symbolizing them here with red words such as growth, invasion, duplications. These genes um, are responsible for cell growth and cell proliferation. You can imagine how this function is essential uh, in, um, for our body because we need to repair tissue damage. We need to grow taller when, you, when we are little. So it's an, an essential physiological function. And in a normal cell, there's a very fine balance between the activity of the red and the blue genes. Now, let's um, 
consider what happened in those triple negative breast cancer genomes with, thousands, with those hundreds and sometimes even thousands of duplications. What we observed is that those duplication tended to occur um, so that they would duplicate the red genes and disrupt the blue genes. So the overall effect of those hundreds of duplication was a genome-wide um, um, gene um, enhancement for the red gene and genome-wide disruption for the blue genes. And that creates a very strong unbalance towards the red signal. And this is really what can drive um, cell transformations into tumor cells. So uh, we observed all of this, but what do we do with this? Can this information help us um, in um, you know, offering new treatment options to triple negative breast cancer patients? Is this knowledge helpful in the clinic? And our um, answer, very simply put, is yes, of course it is, because now we have triple negative breast cancer tumors that we can start to stratify even further. And we can finally put some positivity into what we know about these tumors. So we can stratify them into duplication positive here at the top or negative. And I didn't have a chance to give you all the details about our research, uh, but um, I just want to mention that we also realize that this duplication can come in different flavors. And we start to identify what the original driver of these um, duplications are. And depending on which are the specific genetic drivers that lead to these hundreds of duplication that we can now start developing or uh, simply optimizing treatments in a more specific and personalized manner. And, you know, as I mentioned, some of these treatments are already there. We just have to repurpose them in a more optimized way. And other treatments are not there yet, but now we know more about the biology of the tumors. And so we start developing hypotheses and, um, um, that will eventually lead us to the development of new therapy. And of course, we're still left with uh, triple negative breast cancer that are negative for TDP. They are almost quadruple negative in some ways. And uh, obviously, we are very interested in understanding more about this um, subset of tumors. And really, um, our research is also focusing nowadays on this subtype. But our vision, and not just our lab vision, but the entire research community vision for cancer um, therapy is really a vision where uh, cancer patients are just not treated based on the organ of origin of their cancers, but they are really recognized for the specific DNA alterations that occur in their cancer genomes. And so we can start stratifying patients based on specific DNA changes and alterations, and then subgroup them and define what their optimal treatment is going to be in um, a truly personalized care um, clinical setting. So this was really the bird's eye view of what uh, our research is all about. Um, but I will I'll be very happy to answer some questions um, if you have any. Well, I encourage you to type questions in the Q&A box, and uh, Caitlin's going to be monitoring that, and we'll, we'll jump in with some of those questions. Um, I'll, I'll just start out while we're waiting for everyone to get over their either shyness or uh, uh, get, get their typing fingers engaged. And, and say, this is, this is of course really interesting about the diversification you know, of cancer as a genetic disease and the sort of spewing of mutations in the tandem duplicator phenotype. It's not like one oncogene that gets a specific mutation like a P53 knockout, which is a very common mutation across mm -hmm. cancer. How, how do you see this sort of happening? And, and if there's so many, if every cancer is different because all of these duplications are different, what does that really mean for the possibility of personalized approaches if every cancer is different? Yeah, that's a very good question. And, you know, the answer is that even though the um, variety of duplications is incredibly heterogeneous and each patient has a different set of these duplications and different set of genes that are affected, what is common in all these tumors is the very first alterations that triggers this cascade of um, what we call genomic instability. Um, and we've identified some of these drivers. Um, in one case, I, I just briefly showed you in the slide, the responsible gene is BRCA1, which many uh, of the attendees might be familiar with because has been linked with um, 
uh, familiar breast cancer and ovarian carcinoma. Um, so we, what we realize is that alterations in this gene lead to a, a massive uh, rearrangement of the cancer genome with all these duplications. And therefore, we don't have to target each single duplication, but we can target this, this specific original gene. And in some ways, this major genomic instability, um, which seems like beyond treatment, in fact, it also represents the Achilles heel of the tumor, because these tumors are really prone to accumulate mutation, but there's a threshold even for a cancer cell. And so if we treat these tumors with agents that induce even more mutation, we're going to keep that cancer cell over um, to that threshold um, to a, a point where no more alterations are viable, and so those cells will die. So, so it's kind of a cost. Yeah, yes, there the, is a cost. Developing. Yeah. And but but this only comes. We we really need to understand the biology and the genetics of these events so that we can start exploiting um, some of that in um, in the clinical setting. Katie, do you want to jump in with one of the questions? Sure, I'm happy to. So one of our first questions is, can you explain in general what a treatment actually does to a particular type of cancer to treat it? Well, um, yes, this, this um, I think this is a very interesting question and um, it really depends on the type of treatment, but um, as I was saying before, most in most cases um, for chemotherapeutic agent, for example, what we're trying to do is induce a lot of DNA damage in the cancer cell to a point that all these alterations are incompatible with cell survival and so the cell will die. Um, that's what the generic chemotherapeutic agent does. With targeted therapy, it's a little different. So we're specifically trying to shut down one of the, the main source um, of uh, signaling that tells the cells to keep dupli uh, duplicating and replicating. And so depending on the treatment, it could be a monoclonal antibody that blocks the receptor that is present on the surface of the cancer cell and blocks that signal that tells the cells to continue to proliferate, or it could be a small cell, um, a small molecule that antagonizes that receptor. Um, you know, there's a whole variety of mechanisms. So um, that's also what differentiates a targeted treatment versus a chemotherapeutic treatment. And that's also uh, why uh, we really like targeted treatment because they're very specific for cancer cells and they tend to have fewer side effects for all the other normal cells just because those normal cells just don't have the target. Uh, but there's a whole plethora of different treatment and um, I'm sure our audience has been um, hearing a lot about immunotherapy, for example. That's a completely different approach. That's where we try to um, strengthen our immune system and educate it uh, to recognize tumor cells as um, um, enemies that we have def to defeat. And so that's a completely different mechanism altogether. So it really depends on the type of treatment, but we are trying, uh, the whole research uh, field is trying to move away from chemotherapy and towards more uh, specific approaches that would be much more effective specifically on cancer cells um, and have fewer side effects for the normal cells. I think that really highlights the, the need to understand the biology of each of the different cell types is that the, the precision comes from understanding how to take a sort of a surgical strike against the signaling pathway or the growth promoting feature of the cancer cell specifically without um, targeting everything else that's present in all the other cells in the body. And, that's that's a um, that's really where the promise is is understanding that basic science that leads to what's how how is it that the cancer cell stays alive and progresses and being able to target that directly. So I'm going to jump in with another question, Francesca. Can a subject be estrogen positive but progesterone negative? Yes, yes, there are estrogen positive um, but progesterone negative tumors. And they're treated roughly the same way as the double positive. Um, so yeah, there's also there's also um, a lot of patients are also triple positive. 
Um, and so uh, they are amenable to both therapies, uh, hormonal therapies, monoclonal antibody therapies. Um, yeah. We have a bunch of questions rolling in, so I'm just going to fire away at them. Go on. This is great. <laughs> okay, our next question. To what degree is artificial intelligence used in your research, and what does AI hold for the future of cancer research? Oh, it is such a great question, and I love it because I myself am so fascinated by the use of AI um, in all of this. And um, so um, at JAX, we do some uh, artificial intelligence research. Uh, it's, um, it, you know, it comes down to um, very sophisticated algorithms that try to learn from the data we have um, and then to predict uh, behavior or um, um, morphology or pathology or features. Um, so for example, um, um, we are particularly interested in applying artificial intelligence methodologies to um, diagnose specific um, subtype of cancers um, or even a specific mutations in the cancer just based on the histolog histological um, images that we received you know, after um, uh, pathological diagnosis. So we can train um, our computers to recognize the um, image that is on those slides that we received from the pathologist and to recognize features that the human eye cannot even detect um, that might um, associate with specific alterations or with specific response to therapy. I mean, these are early stages, but I mean, for some type of cancer, this has already been um, optimized and, and sometimes um, the um, these methodologies are even better than pathologies in trying to differentiate between different tumor subtypes and so forth. So that's one aspect um, that um, I can see happening very soon, and, and where also JAX is, is pretty active um, trying to improve research. Um, yeah, I don't know, Mark, maybe you have other ideas as well. Um. Oh, that's 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 a good that's a good answer. I, one uh, clarification question came in. Can you explain what monoclonal antibodies are and how they're used in treatment? Absolutely. So they're um, in, they're a form of drug, and and uh, basically um, they somewhat mimic uh, the um, antibodies that we have in our uh, body, but they are created artificially in the laboratory to specifically recognize. Um, uh, a molecule. So in the case um, that I um, presented before is the HER2 receptor, which is amplified. It means that we have so many uh, copies of it on the surface of HER2 positive cancer cells. So uh, we can artificially generate an antibody that will recognize that receptor, bind to that receptor, and blocks it, its activity. So um, inhibit that signaling to go through the cell and tell the cell to grow and divide. Um, so we're basically exploiting um, nature, our own bodies, and replicating it artificially in order to um, counteract the growth of these cells. And they've really grown um, many, many, many new drugs or monoclonal antibodies. And if, if you're watching TV and you see the ads for all these cancer treatments, they all have a like a trade name or you know, uh, uh, but it, there's also a gen, what's called a generic name, even though they're not generic drugs. Mm -hmm. If those end in AB, then that's a monoclonal antibody. So you can tell what kind of drug it is uh, from from the drug ads if, if you if you uh, if you're interested in doing that. That's right. So I'm going to read a question that I think a lot of us on, on the call today will be interested in. So with triple negative breast cancer, how long before it is determined when it will come back and what is expected in the life expectancy? Well, um, well, first of all, uh, triple negative breast cancer is typically treated um, um, in what is called the neoadjuvant setting. So uh, after a diagnosis, um, oftentimes, like in, in um, regularly, uh, patients will undergo a round of chemotherapy. That's called neoadjuvant because it's before surgery. And um, 
what we know is that how um, a patient responds to neoadjuvant treatment is one of the best predictors of how well that patient will do in the long term. Um, so after new adjuvant setting, patients are uh, assessed for the presence of macroscopic residual disease. Um, they can undergo surgery to remove any residual tumor. Um, and sometimes they just have no macroscopic disease left. So they are um, essentially already cancer free. So that stage is typically what um, in the clinic is considered the best predictor of how those patients will do. Uh, but it's really not um, a very um, precise way to predict um, if the cancer will come back and how soon that will happen. And this is also due to the fact that we don't quite understand yet what drives recurrence in triple negative breast cancer. Is it new mutations that have been acquired? Is it that the tumor was just dormant for a while and then it comes back? There's a lot of theory, a lot of data, but we still don't quite understand exactly what happens. And so it's really hard to predict uh, when and if a tumor will recur. Um, but of course, you know, we have data from clinical trials, so we have some numbers, um, but, um, you know, each patient, it's, it's a little bit of a, a case study on its own, so it's going to be a little difficult to um, project this um, in the more generic terms. So there was a question that came in earlier when we were talking about treatments, but I feel like it'll translate to what we were just talking about right now too. So I'll kind of interpret it that way. Um, so how would you go about finding treatments and do we use mice, for example? Um, yes, we do. So finding treatments. So there, um, I would say there's, um, I'm, I'm gonna oversimplify here, but I can imagine two uh, major um, aspects of finding treatments. One is developing new drugs altogether. So for that, um, you know, typically, um, and, and you know, our laboratory is not doing that, but typically you would have identified a novel target, like one of those genes, whose activity is either enhanced or lost in cancer specifically. Um, and then you'll develop either monoclonal antibodies or maybe small molecules that will interfere with it, that gene activity and so forth. So that's one way. The other way, and that's what we are more interested in, is just repurposing drugs that are already available, treatments that are already out there, but just direct them towards the right patients. Um, so maybe these are treatments were developed for a different cancer type, or um, in a different scenario, and we try to optimize the use of this treatment for the patients that are more likely to respond to them. So how do we do that? Well, it all starts with hypotheses that we um, just make because our data tells us, oh, you know, there's a, a subset of triple negative breast cancer that have this type of uh, alterations that are more likely to respond um, to a drug that will effectively target that alteration. And that we first, the very first test that we do is using cancer cell line. Um, these are individual cells that are grown in culture in our laboratories, and we can provide drugs, we can administer drugs and see what they do. Do they grow? Do they die? How do they die? How quickly? What's the right dosage? And so forth. And we can compare between different drugs. And then the second step is, yes, we move into mouse models. And we can either use mouse model of breast cancer. We are actually, at the Jackson Lab, we are really good at that, at developing mouse models of cancer. We are, in fact, actively uh, producing new mouse models that have these duplications so that we can study how to best um, target these type of tumors. And so we can create a whole cohort of mouse and carry out a clinical trial in, in the mouse where we um, create cohorts of mice that are treated with different drugs or different combinations. But we also use another tool um, that has become more and more available over the past decade or so, which is called patient-derived xenografts. These are, in fact, human tumor tissues that we expand. Can, can I just interrupt and ask you to d say that one more time, patient-derived xenograft, and, and, and I know you're getting ready to explain what it is, but it's a, it's a tongue twister. Yes, patient-derived xenografts. 
So patient, that's the key word. So these are tissue that are derived from patients. So they are a surgical specimen that we obtain um, after a patient has undergone surgery. And we uh, implant them or xenograft them into recipient mice um, that are being created uh, with a compromised immune system so they can accept human tissue. So we implant um, the human tumor, and then we expand it, we let it grow, um, and then we expand it into many different mice. So we create an entire cohort of mice, each one contain, um, harboring the same um, human tumor tissue. And then we, again, we can uh, run a sort of preclinical trial where we create subgroup of mice and we deliver different drugs to each group of mice and we see which drug is more efficient. And this is, um, you know, it's, it's beyond a mouse model of cancer. It's really human cancer uh, that is hosted in an in a organism. So it also gives us a lot of insight into which drugs are better than other, how drugs work together, do they synergize or do they antagonize each other, what's the best um, sequence of drugs to administer um, for treatment or for prevention. So we do all of these type of studies um, to give us hypothesis. And then at the very end, once we are pretty confident that we found a decent drug and uh, or a drug combination that will partner with our um, um, clinical oncologist colleagues and ask them um, to um, you know set up a trial in patients where we can really test, um, have the final test in real patients in the clinic of whether that combination of drug is actually effective. So I think I'll transition to a question pretty pretty similar. We can weave into it. Um, so can you please talk about what the lab is doing for cancer patients in Maine and what, if any, you are learning from this work? Uh, so Mark, do you maybe want to take this one? I can take the first uh, crack yeah. at this one. So um, the JAX is involved in an initiative called the, the Maine Cancer Genomics Initiative. And it's funded by the Alphon Foundation in Maine. And the goal of the project is to bring really cutting edge genetic and genomic analysis into decision making for cancer patients to community oncologists, which is where the vast majority of cancer patients are treated throughout the country. Um, not everybody goes to uh, Johns Hopkins or uh, Dana-Farber for their cancer treatment. Most, uh, most cancer patients are treated in community hospitals. And community hospitals traditionally haven't had the access to uh, the DNA sequencing and bioinformatics that uh, high-end research universities can provide. So we're interested in both uh, exploring how uh, this the, the technologies that we're using can be made available to a broader group of oncologists and patients, and also better understanding what the barriers to that are uh, from, from the patient side, from the oncologist side, and from the decision-making side. So how, and so sometimes, and it's not always, if you sequence the genome of a tumor, you'll get a pretty clear answer of, oh, here's a mutation and a good drug that will work to combat tumors that contain that mutation. And when you have that information, that's a, called a targeted therapy, and with appropriate review of the whole person's clinical history and presentation and prior treatments and everything, um, there are sort of algorithms or choice diagrams for deciding whether or not that therapy is appropriate. And for um, you know, some tumor types, lung cancer, is there's a pretty regimented, oh, well, that's often used and that's a pretty easy question. But sometimes it's not very easy. You see a mutation that shows up often in colon cancer, but here it is in a lung cancer. So is that a good idea or not? And it's getting back to what Francesca was saying earlier is that the molecular features of the tumor and the drivers of it that that matter. So through the Maine Cancer Genomics Initiative, um, Jens Reuter, who's the clinical director of that and uh, at, at a JAX uh, employee, has um, in, recruited something like three quarters of all the oncologists in Maine to be part of this program. And they have set up what's called a molecular tumor board, 
which is a panel of experts who can review the data. So a sample is sent to JAX. JAX does the sequencing and provides the data back to the clinician and to this molecular tumor board for review. And so that involves the bioinformatics experts, the physician, and a, a panel of outside experts to help interpret what the genetic information might mean in the context of that individual patient. So that project has been going on for four years now and has just been um, extended with the support of the Alphon Foundation and JAX to try to make that uh, more uh, sustainable in the future, including not just paid for through a foundation, but uh, encourage the use of um, insurance payments and uh, really integrate it more effectively and fully into the, into the medical treatment system. Thank you, Mark. That was great. So some cells are capable of inactivating or reducing the amount of cytotoxic chemotherapy in the cell. Multi-drug resistance gene expression. What can be done for these patients? Mm -hmm. um, yes, absolutely. So um, the issue of resistance, um, it, resistance can be developed in different ways. Um, and as the um, uh, person who asked the question uh, very well knows um, sometimes cell, the cancer cells will develop ways to get rid of the cytotoxic molecule from the cells. They have pumps that will pump the drug out. They might even avoid the um, drug to enter the cell in the first place. Um, and so, yes, all this, um, it's really the subject of a lot of research, including in our laboratory. So um, what we are doing to address this is developing um, in, in sort of an artificial way um, resistance by um, consistent exposure of tumor cells to a drug. Um, so we um, basically culture cells in the presence of a drug um, until the cells become resistant. And then we address what happened to these cells, why did they develop resistance? We compare the resistant cell from the original cell. Um, we compare the DNA, we compare the um, activity of all the genes, um, and we do all sorts of experiments. And, and there's not an easy single answer, um, but uh, there are patterns, and we're starting to understand those patterns, and we're also starting to um, studied them in mouse models as well as in human data because, you know, we have a lot of data set where we have the original cancer and then we have the cancer that um, relapsed after treatment and that became resistant. So we do all those comparisons to understand um, what was the mechanism of resistance and how can we address that. Oftentimes in the clinic, uh, resistance is simply addressed by um, uh, administering a different drug, um, and that sometimes works, um, sometimes it doesn't. It really depends on the type of cancer, the patient, what type of treatments that the patient has been already exposed to, and uh, how much we understand about the mechanism of resistance. So I see a couple questions here that are a little more targeted and personal, so I'm going to jump to some of those too. So the BRCA gene seems to be more common among the Esterhazy Jewish population. Are there cohorts with greater susceptibility to BRCA or triple negative breast cancer? So yes, this is absolutely true. There are um, BRCA variants that are um, within certain populations that have been uh, transmitted within those populations. So these variants are inherited. So, um, um, so that's why there are in certain populations that have been inherited from generation to generation and they're particularly common in those populations where it's been transmitted from the older generation onwards. Um, but yes, that's why triple negative breast cancer can occur um, in within families because the BRCA1 gene, mutant gene has been inherited um, through generation. And that's why we see these familiar cases of triple negative breast cancer. Um, so we can, um, we can observe this pattern within certain population or within certain families for sure. Um, there are always, uh, there's also um, the possibility of triple negative breast cancer patients that have uh, what we call somatic alteration of BRCA1. It means that these alterations were not inherited from the parents, but just, just occurred sporadically within the cancer cell. That also happens. Um, and um, 
you know, we, we observe that in either case, we still see those duplication happening. So it doesn't really matter whether the gene was inactivated through um, um, the germline line or through the somatic line. We still see a similar behavior downstream of that. Um, but yes, um, I guess I hope I answered the question. Yeah. I definitely think you have. So Francesca, your research, which is focused on breast cancer, can this be applied to other types of cancer as well? Yes, yes, and thank you for this question because um, you know we started off as a breast cancer lab, but, but then we pretty quickly realized that what we saw in triple negative breast cancer was actually um, um, also found in ovarian carcinoma, which is not a big surprise because you might uh, know that, uh, for example, the BRCA1 gene is, an, in, is responsible uh, for triple negative breast cancer, but also is very um, strongly associated with ovarian carcinoma. So there's a very similar genetic uh, between um, these two type of cancers, and that's exactly what we found. So. Um, when we observe this, that we start moving into ovarian carcinoma as well. And the clinical history of ovarian carcinoma is very different from that of triple negative breast cancer. So um, the treatment options and the overall, you know, um, how the tumor is diagnosed and how it eventually develops, it, it's a bit different, but the genetics is very similar. So we are particularly interested in understanding this and understanding tissue specificity. Um, so for example, why BRCA1 inactivation is so strongly linked to triple negative and ovarian carcinoma and not other tumor types, for example. So these are all questions that are very dear to us um, and we are working on them. Awesome. One more question. So cancer is such a complex disease and you've alluded to that. In your opinion, do cancer treatments need to be equally as complex or have we overcomplicated them in our desire to find a cure? <laughs> a loaded um, question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I, to be very honest, I, I wouldn't think of treatments complicated. It's complicated because for certain tumor types, we have so many options and so um, a lot of subsetting and stratifying and understanding, and the regimens can be different. It's, it's true, um, you know, that um, uh, you have different dosage, different regimens, and but are they complex? Um, I don't know. I think we'll just get more and more treatment options in the future. So if anything, we'll get more and more complicated uh, in trying to be more and more successful. I think we need that that degree of, you know, complexity. I assume to um, to really make sure that we're using all of our options and that we're, um, you know, being as comprehensive as possible. I'm not sure. Maybe I didn't quite. Yeah, I, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll agree with you on that. I think it's the, the, the nature of precision is that you have the right solution to the right problem. And as Francesca has said, cancer really is complicated. It's a complicated disease. It's complicated within a single person, let alone between people, because as the tumor develops, it mutates, and then mutant, mutations can accumulate. But Mutations accumulating doesn't mean that every cell is the same. Every cell can end up different and have its own challenges. And that's one of the things that one of the things that leads to metastasis, not the only thing. And metastatic tumors are often quite unlike the primary tumor that they're derived from because they've accumulated mutations. And so I, I do think that again, understanding all of the tricks that cancer cells use to evade the immune system, to evade, uh, to escape from the site in the body that they belong, and to continue to divide and grow. It's not an unlimited number of strategies, but it's still a lot. And I think the idea of trying to understand those and how they work together to be able to come up with the strategies to interfere with those in a cancer-specific way it is important. So we actually have time for one more question. So I'll read one more and I think this will be our last one. So Francesca, what is something that has surprised you about this disease over the course of conducting your research? 
something that has surprised me. Well, I have to, you know, have to go back to those duplications because that was a very <clears throat> unexpected finding, very serendipitous. So that was at the very early days, at least for me, a little bit for the research community as well, of um, next generation sequencing, which is this whole uh, plethora of novel technologies that are now not that novel anymore, but at that time they were, that allow us to economically and quickly get the entire sequence of the cancer genome. So, um, you know, at that time, we were, I would have to confess, we were kind of playing around with the technologies a bit and get, uh, you know, acquire um, cancer tissues and just sequence them and say, okay, let's look like we can look at everything right now. Let's just have, have a quick look, not necessarily thinking precisely of what we would find, but just let's look at how these genomes look like. And then, so we start looking at some breast cancer, some HER2 positive, ER positive. And then all of a sudden, we start sequencing triple negative breast cancer and look at all this duplication. And the first thought was, oh, this is a technical um, error, it's a mistake, it's an artifact. But that, you know, we, we have tools to validate and confirm and uh, everything checked through. And so that was um, a little bit unusual because this is really something that we hadn't seen in other genomes before. It's very specific. So that was a bit, a bit of a surprise, but it was also like this, you know, the starting point of very interesting um, uh, line of research that really, um, in the end, again, surprisingly, brought us back to the BRC1 gene, which was something we already knew about. We just didn't know that all these duplications would be related to the BRC. So it's like a circle somehow um, that helped us really um, get a, a very um, deeper understanding of BRC1 biology and triple negative breast cancer biology. So I think maybe that was my big surprise. I think that's a good um, rationale, or not rationale, it's right, not the right word, but a good example of how applying new technologies lets you ask questions that weren't that weren't asked for before. So se whole genome sequencing, sequencing with long reads to try to really understand the organization of the genome and, and these tandem duplications, as you said, single cell genomic approaches where you can, un you can measure which genes are turned on in thousands of individual cells from a sample at the same time to understand their diversity and how immune cells and tumor cells interact with each other. These kinds of technologies give new kinds of data that you can then mine to try to understand, uh, to, to look for new things that you weren't expecting. And it's that serendipity of, of uh, discovery that really is fun and that, that moves the field forward. That's true. That's great. Thank you both, Mark and Francesca. That was really fascinating. And thanks to all of you who submitted these thoughtful and engaging questions. We're so glad you could be with us all this afternoon, and I hope you'll consider joining us for our next virtual juxtaposition focused on the science of addiction, which will take place on Wednesday, October 7th from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. Eastern. We will follow up with all of you shortly to share a video recording of today's event, as well as more details about how to register for additional upcoming events in our speaker series. Thank you and have a great rest of your afternoon.